I want to carve some time out of tonight's show to share something I figured out over the break. You know, we all experience and engage in passive aggressive behavior, but thanks to the way we use technology now, there's a new way to be passive aggressive that's not as easy to understand. It's the passive aggressive text message. Now, if you don't know what I mean by that, here's an example. You ask a simple question like this, can I bring Dave to dinner tonight? And the person to whom you're texting replies, sure, with an explanation point at the end. Now, if you got this text, you could reasonably assume that the person on the other end is happy about Dave coming to dinner, maybe even excited about. But what about this? You ask, can I bring Dave to dinner tonight? And your husband or wife or girlfriend says, sure, with a period. <laughs> Almost an identical text, but the subtext of the text, not that period. Instead of the exclamation, exclamation point means either I thought we were going out just the two of us, or I don't care if Dave comes, or maybe it means I don't like Dave. <laughs> you don't know. Well, let's look at another example here. A simple message, you ask, can you pick up some milk on the way home? And your text mate replies, of course. Now, if you got this, you can assume there will be a container of milk in your refrigerator when this person gets home. But what if you ask the same question, you say, can you pick up some milk on the way home? And the response is the letter K. <laughs> if you got this, I think you can assume the person will get the milk but isn't happy about it. The letter K is like the text equivalent of rolling your eyes at someone. It's like what a teenager does when you ask how her day was. But a K is no good, but this might be worse. Now, try again, can you pick up some milk on the way home? And the answer is, yup. <laughs> yup translates to, oh, I'll get the milk, but why can't you get the milk? <laughs> I'm working all day, you had nine hours to go get milk, and now I'm at being asked to go get the milk, right? Now, yup should never be confused with yep. Yep is, yep's okay, yep is friendly. <laughs> yep is upbeat, but if the E changes to you, that person probably wants to push you into a wood chipper. <laughs> I want to mention one more. Maybe this might be the most passive-aggressive of all the passive-aggressive texts. It's this. Uh, this response. Ha. <laughs> ha, it, ha says, I acknowledge that what you said was meant to be funny. It wasn't, but... <laughs> can you imagine in real life you made a joke and someone said, ha? <laughs> you can't, because no one would ever do. You would have... If they did, you would fight them, right? So, just to recap, when texting, uh, avoid using periods, yups, and ha's, and most importantly, never, ever use your phone to make a call. That you never do. <laughs> Nobody likes that anymore. It's annoying. <laughs> uh, it's funny, and it's true. And when you think about it, there is a lot of power in changing a letter, a nuance, a word, your tone, our words have incredible power. And last week we started a series called The Gift of Words. The gift, we believe that the right word said to the right person at the right time might be one of the most meaningful gifts that you could give, not just this holiday season, but in life. Especially to the people who are around you, the people that matter most. Last week I encouraged you to commit to memory a verse that this whole series is kind of rooted in comes from Colossians. I I'm not going to ask you for a quiz this weekend, but I will next weekend. And so this is your fair warning that I'm going to do this next week. We'll see if you can say the verse without using the slide. But this week, just to help participate in the process of memorization, we're going to put the verse up on the screen. And at all of our campuses, if you're watching from some other device or living room or whatever, say it out loud with me. It's my way of serving you, of helping you begin to memorize this. Let's say this out loud together. The verse is up. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let your conversations be full of grace. In other words, let your words be gifts that you give, and grace, grace means whether they deserve it or not. I love that, that framework. You know, what's going to be fun is when you teach your kids this, if you have kids, teach your friends this, and you know, in the middle of some heated fellowship or a little, you know, 
debate, we are gonna, you're going to see this verse as you memorize it come to mind. It's going to be great when the kids challenge parents with this verse. It's like, Dad, let your conversation be full of grace. It's like, ah. Oh. Uh, you know, the other part of that that I like is that phrase, seasoned with salt. Now, that's not permission to be salty, people, okay? That does not mean you can go and just say whatever you want, but I think sometimes our conversations are rather bland. They're rather empty. They're not witty. They're not attractive. We're not thinking about our words. We're assuming too much. And so as you put the two of those together, we'll know how to answer everyone. We'll know how to give the gift of our words. And if you were here last week, I talked about this. Never underestimate the value of genuine appreciation. Hopefully this past week, you were able to give some genuine appreciation. You took time to identify and acknowledge the full worth of something or someone. No elbows. I mean, you don't need to start throwing elbows to the you know, person next to you if they didn't. But there's an incredible value in doing this. And what's beautiful about appreciation is you can give it to anyone at any level, strangers or friends. It's a gift that you give with your words. But this week, I'm going to talk about the power that our words can have. Especially around this one word called pride. So, before we look at the passage and step into the big idea, I'm going to invite you to take a deep breath with me and just say, okay, God, I'm here to learn. And I know there, you know, I know what sometimes the ride into church can be like, a little intense, a little, you know, challenging to get everybody together, or maybe you're thinking about what's next. I know there's a few of you that's praying for the Ohio State Buckeyes to make the playoffs, so go ahead, get your prayers in now, and then let's get to work, Okay. Let's pray together. God, thank you for every person that's here. And thank you that we do have the capacity to learn, to change, to grow. And so help us do that. God, anything that's competing for our heart, our attention, any of those emotions or agenda items, would you just help us for a few minutes set them aside and be mindful and be present? now for what you want to give each of us. And God, use me in any way that you can in the time we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as always, I just, I'm so thankful that you're here. Whatever campus you're at, whatever device you're watching us on, if you're in a living room somewhere, thank you for taking time to share with us. It's a privilege for me. If you're here for the first time, my name is Ben. I'm the lead pastor. And I want to share with you our hope every time that you come. We really desire to help you take a step somewhere in your journey. And usually, for many of us, I need, we need regular reminders to know God. We need to know, our hope is to create a little space where you know God, and not just know about Him, but you begin to know Him personally in your life. You begin to interact with Him as in, in a personal relationship, which may seem bizarre to some of you, depending on where you're at. But that's our hope. And we believe that as you do that, you're going to be made aware of some areas that you feel stuck in. Maybe you're not even aware that you're stuck where God wants to help you find freedom, where he wants to help you surrender or move past or overcome or break through some area of your life that sometimes is challenging, sometimes is rewarding, but is always freeing. And as you do that, I think it opens up our inner person, our mind, to be able to wrap our hearts and minds around the fact that God has a dream that he has put inside of each and every one of you. A dream that you have to live for something that matters, to make a difference. But in order to do that, you have to discover how God has wired you and stop trying to be someone else, step into the person that God's created you to be. And as you do that, you're gonna begin to take your first steps in making a difference. And I, we, I have seen people and I have experienced people take steps in this journey time and time again. They are steps that we continually take and it is so rewarding. And so this week, when I talk about the big idea, this isn't just something that someone out there, I think this is someone right where you're sitting needs to hear. And I think as you receive that, it's not only going to change the way that you give the gift of words, it's going to change the way that you look at your life. And that's my hope. So if you're taking notes, here's the big idea. Never underestimate the power of I'm proud of you. Never underestimate the power of I'm proud of you. Last week, it was the value. This week, it's the power. And the reason I, I said the word power is because of that one word, pride. Pride is a, an interesting word. It, just to help clarify what pride means, you can write this in your notes. Pride is the feeling of deep pleasure or admiration. 
We feel pride when our favorite team wins, right? Buckeye fans, it feels good when the, your team, whatever your team is, wins their game or whatever. It, that, that feels great. And when they don't win, we're like Notre Dame and they don't play. It's kind of like, ugh, you know, it's boring. You know, some people even get frustrated. Some people on the extreme feel ashamed when their team doesn't win. But pride is that deep feeling of pleasure. You know where else I feel pride? Occasionally, I'm able to travel outside of the country. We went to Moldova to see some work that we, we had partnered with some organizations there to help free um, orphans from sex trafficking. And so you go there and you experience that culture. We've been partnered with a Great Commission Latin America. I keep pointing as if they're behind me back on the stage, you know. We've been partnering with Latin America for, for years. And when you go down and you see the work that really many of you are doing, you don't even realize it, the lives, the communities that you are transforming through our partnership with these local churches, these indigenous churches, it is phenomenal. But one of the areas where I feel pride is when I come back to the United States and I step foot back into our soil. I see our flag, not because those countries are bad, but because I'm reminded how thankful I am to live where I get to live. Man, I, I feel pride at our country and what we get to enjoy here. You know, another area where I feel pride, maybe you feel pride, is when you accomplish something that you didn't think you were going to be able to do. It could be exercise, it could be at work, it could be with your family, it could be small, it could be big, but we feel pride. You know, you, you know some, some of these pride people. There are new, pro, new car people, new car guy, new, curl, no, new car girl, you know, where they get the new car and they're like, check it out. And they're like, they, they feel pleasure and they feel admiration. You know what's interesting is there's a, like on the opposite end, there's old car guy, old car girl. You know, they're like, look at my car. And you're like, what am I looking at? They're like 450 billion miles on this thing. You know, I've, I feel, I've had this thing since I was three. You know what I mean? And it's barely got duct tape around it. We feel pride in all sorts of areas of our life, but when was the last time someone said to you, I'm proud of you? I mean, when I ask this, it typically gets quiet. People start thinking, and they struggle to remember the last time they heard that. Isn't that kind of sad? I mean, when, when when I talk to my team here, some of my friends, I have a feeling that if I were to ask you to put your hands up, if you can't remember the last time your parents, if ever, have said, I'm proud of you, I think we would be shocked at the number of hands that would go up in the air. We'd be shocked. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, no, that, that would, I say that, you'd be shocked. In fact, I had one conversation with one of our team members, and he looked, and he said, I can tell you the three times where my dad said, I'm proud of you. It's powerful. It is so powerful. And yet, unfortunately, we probably don't say it, and we don't receive it enough. And here's why it's so powerful. Because in that one phrase, I'm proud of you, when we give this sort of pride, it gives the gift of significance. When somebody says, I'm proud of you, it makes you feel significant. It makes you feel like uh, somebody's paying attention to me. Somebody's noticing. It feels powerful, but, but that's why I put the words in quotes, because the gift that pride gives is the gift of significance. And sometimes the way that we try to claim that gift is not helpful, it's harmful. That's why the Bible is full of warnings about pride. Pride goes before the fall. God opposes the proud. And so if we're not careful, we'll start to pursue significance in ways that God knows won't give us that gift. What do I mean by that? Well, the first one is this. Some people falsely assume that because God opposes the proud and what they're not taking into consideration is some of the nuance between the English language and the original language that the scriptures were written in. The, whole, the, the Bible was written in Hebrew and, 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 and um, Greek. And so they, they say, well, then the conclusion is we should have no pride. In other words, I should have no significance or I have no significance in any feeling of significance. They try to flush from their system as if that is humility. What's fascinating and heartbreaking is that's the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that you are not significant. 
The Bible teaches that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. In fact, this Christmas season, why is the Christmas story so powerful? Because when God looked at a broken world, he saw something significant, so significant, he sent his son. And so no pride isn't the solution. In fact, I love the quote that says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's not looking at yourself in the mirror and going, I'm insignificant. Humility is just saying, I'm going to think of myself less. I'm not going to participate in what I call haughty pride. I was trying to be cute with the H's. Haughty is kind of a word we don't use that often in in our common vernacular today. I'm not saying naughty pride. I'm not saying haughty pride. I'm talking about haughty pride. It's when I use what I have to give significance to me. I use my words. I use my social media account. I use my work. I use my money. I use my stuff to make me feel significant. That's haughty pride. Haughty pride says at the end of the day, I'm proud of the me that others see. I'm proud of the me that others see. We try to make ourselves look great so that the people around us will tell us that we're significant. We'll notice how significant that we are. Now, I would love to say that I don't struggle with this ever in my life, but I would be a liar and we're at church, so let's just be honest, okay? And so here are some areas where I know that I struggle with or I take steps into haughty pride. Here's one that happens uh, more uh, often than I'd like to admit. It's when I interrupt people. We'll be sitting around as a team trying to come up with some creative ideas or problem solving, bringing strategy to our organization, you know, multiple campuses, and people will be talking. You know what I'll do? Sometimes I'll just interrupt. (laughs) I'll interrupt because my idea is so significant. Oh, yeah, yeah, your idea is good, but wait till you hear what I have to say. I mean, that is haughty. That is pride. That is not helpful. And I am basically saying my idea is more significant than what you have to say. You know what? Sometimes, sometimes I'll even try to wrap it in this language like, I'm just going to say it before I forget. That's like my rationale. That's my excuse why it's okay to interrupt other people. And so, hopefully, you know, I think you know, many of you are probably better at this than me, but that's one area that I have to watch. You know, another area that I have to watch is when I try to one-up someone else's story. Someone will share a story, and I'll be like, well, wait till you hear what I did. What am I saying? Your idea was great, but mine's more significant. I'm proud of the me that you're about to see. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about this thing. Another area that I'm, if I'm not careful of is I, I, I'm tempted to claim credit for things that aren't mine. And so somebody will be like, man, that was awesome. And, it's, I, and there's one thing to say thank you, to acknowledge and receive that. We talked about that last week. But when we start walking away, claiming credit, believing our own press clippings, it's not helpful. It's haughty. It's arrogant. And the Bible warns us about that. And you know what? What happens when you encounter someone who is like that? It's annoying. I mean, I get annoyed at myself when I see myself do this. It doesn't help build significance. It's incredibly insecure. You're not giving the gift of I'm proud of you. You're asking people for the gift. Hey, will you tell me? Will you tell me? Will you tell me how significant I am? And that's not the way that God wired you to live. There's a more subversive way to live this haughty pride out. And this shows itself in the way in which we talk about our spouse, our friends, our teammates, and especially our kids. And it goes like this. I'm proud of the me that others see in you. I'm proud of the me that others see in my team, in my spouse, in my kids. So sometimes we tell stories about our team, our friends, our spouse, our kids. Sometimes we name drop. Sometimes we talk about our kids as a way of making us look great as parents. It's not really about them. It's I'm proud of the me. I find pleasure and admiration in the me that you see in them. You know, sometimes you see this in the dad that's only excited or proud of his son when he plays football because he played football, when he's good at engineering because he's an engineer, when he reads because, or she reads because her mom likes or dad likes to read. When we see our reflection in other people, and that's the only time that we're proud. Man, that is haughty. That is about us. If we're not careful, you know, we will let this begin to... push itself into other areas of our life. And the Bible is full of statements like the one I'm about to read that comes from Philippians. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. But instead, be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Not thinking of yourself as insignificant. Not thinking less of yourself. Just thinking of yourself less. 
so helpful and so hard at the same time. If, if we don't rein in this haughty pride, you know where it leads? It leads to harmful pride. It begins to give us permission to do this. I am begin to use what you lack to give significance to me. I start saying things like, well, yeah, did you see so-and-so over there? Do you see what they lack? Yeah, because I'm glad I figured that out. Do you see what they're doing? Oh, yeah, they're really struggling with that. I'm glad I'm not struggling with that. Uh, you, you, we'll even use the I'm proud of you statement. Oh, I'm so, maybe you've heard this before. Um, I'm so proud of you. You finally found someone. Thanks. I mean, it's like, what, what do you say to that? I'm so proud of you. You finally got a real job. Yeah, for some of you, you're like, the job that you have isn't real to grandma, grandpa, dad, mom, somebody, friend, you know, whatever. They just look at what you do, and they, they shake their head, you know? Playing video games for a living. I didn't know that could be, be a job. I don't really know that that's a job either. Maybe for some, but you know, you know what I mean. You know, sometimes we'll say, I'm so glad that you finally figured this out. Whatever this is. What are they saying? What is that statement saying? It's saying that I have a significance that I figured out a long time ago, and you're finally catching up to me. That, we talked about this last week. That's not a compliment. That's like a compliment, okay? That's, that's, that's not making anybody, that's not giving a gift. You're actually taking the gift of significance from them. Do you know what that's called? It's called shaming. It's pointing out what people lack. Their insignificance as a way of validating yourself. That is harmful. And if we're not careful, we'll try to sound like we're affirming and we're actually making people feel insignificant. And if this is left unchecked, do you know where it leads people? To a radical abuse of pride and power. And you see this on the headlines today. Tragically, with enormous amount of men in powerful positions. And you know what they're doing? They're using their power and pointing out or, or, or they are aware of what some women, what others lack, and they're using what they lack to bring significance to their ego, to them. It's harmful. It's disgusting. And so if we're not careful, pride doesn't give gifts. It takes gift, gifts from the people around. It takes significance. So what is helpful pride really look like? I put it this way in your notes. It's when I use what I have to give significance to you. That is what humility is. Humility isn't saying, I'm insignificant, I have nothing to offer. That's just a twisted form of ego. You're still consumed with yourself. Humility is when you acknowledge what you have and you offer it to invest it in the significance of others. I have a listening ear, so instead of one-upping your story, I'm going to listen to yours. I, I have time, I have resources, I have energy to give to invest in your significance. And today, I specifically want to talk about the use of your words, especially the phrase, I'm proud of you. Because you can use your words to either build people up, to, to validate to give them the gift of significance, or you can use it to take from them. And wh where I want to look is a story in the Bible where Jesus hears his heavenly Father say, I'm proud of you. Oh, you maybe have heard this story before. It's, it, it's in all, all four gospel accounts are uh, uh, eyewitness, not eyewitness, accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all share this story. And most likely, very few of them were actually there for the event. Maybe one or two of them were, but the eyewitness accounts of this moment were so significant that they all heard about what took place with Jesus and John the Baptist. So let's look at this together. It's Matthew chapter 3. You can follow along in your notes or on the screen. It says, Jesus, then Jesus, went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. Now, some, some of you have pictured this in your mind. Maybe you've seen it depicted in the movies. And just, just for geography's sake, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, is in northern Israel. And at the bottom part of Israel is the Dead Sea, you know, that salty Dead Sea that people float in. And what connects them is the Jordan River. And most scholars debate where the actual baptism took place. Jesus didn't put a little stake in the ground that said, I was baptized here. And so many scholars believe that because of who John the Baptist was, it took place closer to the Dead Sea, and in the country of Jordan today, on the border of Jordan and Jeru or, uh, Israel, is a site that looks like this. That's the Jordan River. Now, I don't know what you pictured for the Jordan River, but before I visited, I had envisioned the Mississippi River, something big, massive, beautiful, strong, flowing. That's more like Jordan Creek, 
okay? It's not impressive. It's not cute. Very muddy. In fact, if you think about it, if Jesus would have walked on water there, if he would have walked across the Jordan Creek, nobody would have been impressed. You could pole vault over this thing. You know, it's like, it's, it's unsubstantial. But this is the site where John the Baptist was baptizing. And you may be asking, like, well, why is he baptizing? Maybe you're not asking. Maybe you just assume that's something that Christians do. Well, this was before Jesus died on the cross. and I mean, we have baptism tubs set up at all of our campuses this weekend. People are taking a public step. They're making a public declaration of a personal commitment to follow Christ. And so the symbolism that is in baptism is somebody going under the water. They're being baptized in. They're, they're basically saying, I'm done living for me. They're acknowledging Jesus' death on the cross and that they're living out of the power of his resurrection to start a new life. So why are Jews baptizing? Well, for, for John the Baptist, he was basically a traveling preacher. And baptism was a public confession. It was, I need a new start. I want a new beginning. And so people would show up, kind of like modern-day Dr. Phil, just to listen to John preach and see who was going to get baptized today. I wonder where the sinners are at today. Who, I wonder what they did, you know? John would be preaching, and people would be like, yep, that convicted me. I need a fresh start. They'd go down to the river, and he'd baptize them, and he would keep preaching. And on this particular day... Jesus goes to the river, Jordan River, to be baptized by John. Look at what John says. John tried to talk him out of it. Listen, bro, you don't need this, but Bill over in the corner, yeah, he needs it. Just, you, you know what I mean? He's trying to talk him out of it. He says, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, so why are you coming to me? Think about it. I mean, what was the public perception of Jesus at this point? What did he accomplish? We don't, we don't know. I mean, most of the details of Jesus' first 30 years of life are obscure. There's one story where he was like 12. And so for the common audience member, they just looked at him as random guy named Jesus. Not Jesus the way that we think of him. He, they may have known that he was a carpenter who did something really bad because he's going to the river to get baptized. You know what I mean? But John knows something different. How does John know something different? Because his mom is Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is cousins with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they shared stories about what God had told them about their sons. And so John knew who Jesus was. And what's fascinating to me is he doesn't try to leverage this for haughty pride. He doesn't look at everybody and go, hey, uh, everybody pay attention. Do you know what I'm about to do? Do you know who this is? Oh, my name's going to be in the book. I'll be signing autographs afterwards. I'll go on tour. This is kind of a big deal. Pay attention. No, where does he find his significance? In following Jesus. He knows that's ultimately where his significance needs to come from. And I, I love how Jesus replies. He says, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. And so John agreed to baptize him. Jesus is saying, you know what, this needs to happen because each of us, myself included, and you know who I am, we all need to do what God requires of us. Where does Jesus find his significance? And what the people think about him walking into the muddy Jordan Creek? No. He finds his significance in following what God asks him to do. So the question is, where do you find your significance? Because either you're following Jesus and finding your significance in him, or you're just fascinated with him. Some of you aren't fascinated. You're fighting against him and trying to find your significance somewhere else. And do you know what's amazing about God? Is he knows where you're at and he loves you all the same. He wants to gently guide you to find your significance in him. And so... John agrees to baptize him in the muddy Jordan River. And here's this scene. Maybe you've seen it before. After his baptism, as Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavens were opened up, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and settling on him. I mean, it's one of those, you know, first of all, you've got to go back and picture the Mississippi River. It just makes for a better movie, you know, and, and better scenery. And the light burst onto the scene. And, and I don't know why, but when it says that the light shines down as Jesus was coming out of the water, I, I have the picture of Beauty and the Beast, you know, where Beast is like on the floor, and he's, 
being elevated to the top. I have seen too many Disney movies. I know it's young kids, but that's what I visualize when this happens. And then what's with the dove? You know, it's like I would have picked something else, like a lion or an eagle. A dove? Give me a break. But for that culture, a dove symbolized a few key things that helps us understand what's happening. A dove was a messenger. If you think about the story of Noah and the ark, for those of you that know, they sent out a dove to figure out where the dry land, if there was dry land. Doves were used to carry written messages in those days. A dove was also a symbol of peace. We still use that today. A dove was a symbol of purity. We still use that today. A uh, dove soap, hello. And so here in this one moment, God is trying to give a picture of what the Holy Spirit's role is in our life and in Jesus' life. It's a messenger. It's a symbol of purity. It's a symbol of peace. And in this moment, as Jesus is participating in the activity that's meant for sinners, God descends upon him. God, the Holy Spirit, descends upon him to launch him into a public ministry. And that's when God the Father says these words. A voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. I love the way that it says it in the NIV. So this is my son, who I love, and whom I'm, with whom I am well pleased. Again, this is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. That is a powerful statement. That is a powerful statement. Essentially, God is saying, hey, everybody, I want you to know who this is. I want you to know what I think about him. And I want you to know that I'm proud of him. I'm really proud of this kid. Think of all of the things God could have said. And instead of all of the other things he could have said, he gave the gift of an I'm proud of you. In fact, God and Jesus talk throughout Jesus' life. He talks about going away to pray to God, but God audibly speaks twice. And he says the same thing both times. Why? Because helpful pride, the gift of I'm proud of you, establishes the significance, if you're taking notes, of who we are, of what we are, and of where we are. Helpful pride, when you use what you have to establish the significance of others, they know who they are, they're clarified what they are, and it clarifies where they are, who they are. Have you ever asked the question, who am I? Have you ever wondered, who am I? I mean, sometimes we think about that, but here, G God takes what is kind of random dude to the audience, and he says, this isn't random dude, this is, who is he? My son. This is who he is. This is my relationship with him. He belongs to me. That's so important because you can give appreciation to anyone at any level, but when it comes to the I'm proud of you, those are statements that are typically reserved for people that you're close to. And it's a gift that you give, and you need to remind them who they are. You know what God wants to remind you? God wants to remind you who he sees you as. For those who have placed their faith in Christ, you are a part of God's family. You're his sons, adopted sons and daughters. You're valuable to God. You're a part. That's the relationship that he has with you. So the question that I would ask is, whose voice is shaping your significance? Is it God's? Are you listening to who God says you are? Or are you looking other places? Are you listening to other voices? Do other voices have more authority than his? I mean, is it your social media account and how many likes and interactions and friends you have? I mean, is that really where you want to base your significance? Is it your coworkers? Is it maybe a, a parent? Or maybe it's somebody that's toxic? Maybe it's what culture says. Who's shaping your significance? Because if it's not God, essentially you're posturing yourself with the people around you for them to tell you to give you the gift of significance. God did not create you to live that way. He's created you for more. In fact, he believes that you will only find your true significance when you find it in him and who he says you are. Once we get clear on that, it helps us change the way that we look at the people around us and we can start to think, whose significance are you shaping with your voice? How are you using what you have to shape the significance of your kids, of your spouse, of your team, of your friends? One of the ways that I do this with my kids 
as I try to say as often as I can, I am so glad that I get to be your dad. I'm reminding them who they are. I'm reminding them whose they are, that no matter what they do, where they go, what happens, how they perform, where they end up, nothing's going to change the fact that they're my kids, and that makes me proud. I find pleasure in the fact that I get to be their dad. So I try to tell them that all the time. I don't want my kids not able to remember their father saying, I'm proud of you just because they're my sons, my daughters. We need to say that with our significant others, with our teammates. We need to use our words to remind people who they are so that then they will begin to understand what they are. God says, this is my son whom I love. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, hey, this is my son and he's going to change the world. He didn't say, this is my son. Wait till you see what he can do. Miracles. Wait, oh, this is my son. You know what? He's going to die on the cross for your filthy sins and then he's going to come back from the dead. Wait till you see this. You're not going to want... He didn't talk about any performance. He did not talk about any action. No, the what was that Jesus was loved first. I mean, what had Jesus accomplished at this point, spiritually? Very little of biblical notoriety, and yet God still loved him the same way that God loves you. No matter how you've been performing lately. The question, is my significance rooted in what I do or what God says that I am? Do you think that God is looking at you, evaluating his worth, his, your significance based on your performance? Because if that's the case, we all fall miserably short every day. We don't even live up to our own standards. Like when I go home at night and, and it's late and I know I shouldn't eat Oreos or those peanut butter M&Ms, but I violate my own rules that I set for myself, let alone God's. God says to each of us that you're loved. He offers the gift of acceptance to define what you are, accepted by God when you place your faith in Christ. He offers the gift of forgiveness so that you can be what? Forgiven. He wants to clarify not just who you are, but what you are, that you should find, we should find our significance in that more than what we do, which means when we start to look at the people around you, am I rooting other significance in their identity or their performance? Is the only time you're proud of your friends, your spouse, your kids, is when they're performing really well at school, at work, or they accomplish or do something great, when they're doing what you really want them to do around the house? Is that the only time that you're proud of them? Or do you give words that remind them that they're loved and that they're accepted and that they belong? Are you building up their significance based on what God says is truly significant? Man, let's use our words to give powerful gifts to reminding people of who they are, of what they are. And I think when that happens, then it'll help us make sense of where we are. I mean, God said, this is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. What is he well pleased about? What is he proud about? The fact that Jesus got into the muddy water of the Jordan River to get baptized like the rest of the sinners? I, mean, I think what you see God doing, the same way that he does later on, is he finds a point in Jesus' life to mark a moment. And maybe God is saying, hey, I'm proud of where you've come from to where you're at today. I'm proud of the journey that you've been on, and I'm just marking the moment. I'm proud of you. This moment right now, you need to hear me say that because you left heaven and you came to the earth that you've created. You even got baptized like the sinners that you're about to die for, giving them a picture of the purpose of your life. I'm proud of where you've come from. We need to be able to say those sorts of things to the people around us. It's so valuable. I'm proud of where you've come from. It builds significance in the journey that they've been on. Maybe God was saying, I'm proud of where you're going. Maybe Jesus, or God was saying to Jesus, his son, hey, I'm, I'm marking this moment to say, hey, now I love where you're going. Man, keep it up. And maybe sometimes we need to use our words to believe in people beyond the significance that they see in themselves. And because you know what? Sometimes it is hard to be proud of somebody's accomplishments when their life is a little bit of a mess. And instead of 
coming down on them with shame, and instead of manufacturing some lie, like, I'm really proud of you, but I, I got nothing. Instead, believe in people for what they can't believe in themselves today. Be proud of where you see their potential going because God knew that Jesus was beginning his public ministry. You know, the other time that God said this was near the end of his public ministry and right before he was about to be betrayed and crucified and tortured. And maybe God was just reminding him, hey, hey, it's gonna get rough, but don't lose sight of what's truly significant. You're my son, whom I love, And I'm proud of where you've been. And I'm proud of where you're going. Give the gift of an I'm proud of you. Maybe a question that you could ask is the direction of my life pleasing to God? Notice I I didn't say destination. I didn't say perfection. Perfection. So often we confuse God's priority around perfection and we don't think he values direction, and he does. Are you taking steps in a direction that is pleasing to God? Some people this weekend are going to take the step of baptism to publicly say, hey, my life, I'm not perfect, but I'm taking a step towards God. It, It says it this way in the Psalms, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He loves when we take steps in his direction. And he goes on to say he delights, he is proud, he finds pleasure in every detail of their lives. God loves it when we move in his direction. Are you moving in that direction? Maybe today is just a little reset to pick back up wherever you've been and start to mark out a step towards God in your personal life moving forward. As we get clear on that, then the question becomes, how can I help you? How can we help the people around us take a step towards God in your life? How can we use our words? How can we say that I'm proud of you? That say, you know what? You may not be able to see it where you're at today, but I believe in what's possible. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of where you're going. I'm proud of where you've come from. Here's what I'm going to ask. This season, I want you to find a person or two or three and verbally say in a note or to their face, I'm proud of you. Here's who you are. Here's what you are. And here's where you've been or where you're going And it's why I'm so proud of you. Parents, tell your kids, please. I know, I know, I know what some of you are thinking, but Ben, you don't know what my son or daughter's dealing with. I'm I'm, I'm not feeling any pleasure or any admiration with where they're struggling. Well, ask God to help. And for some, you may not be able to do it today, but I promise you, if you could tell your kids, it'd be a game changer. Find ways to give the gift, the powerful gift of I'm proud of you. And and will you take time to listen to what your heavenly father says about you? That he says, I'm so glad I get to be your dad. That you matter to him more than you could ever imagine. Will you find your significance in him more than any other voice? Especially during the holidays because he looks at someone like you, each and every one of you, and he sees something that he is proud of, who you are, who he says you are, what he says you are, and where he could take you. It delights his heart. So let's enjoy that gift that he has given each of us. And if you've never taken your first step in this journey with God, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. He's not waiting for you to clean up your life and get perfect and do it all right. He's waiting for you to receive what Jesus came to give, forgiveness on the cross. When he came back from the dead, it's it's the gift of eternal life. But you have to say, yes, God, I want this for me. And so if you've never done that, would you bow your head right now in the seat that you sit, in the quietness of your heart, and make that your prayer. If you need words, use these. God, I want to receive the gifts that you want to give me today. 
And I've been trying to find my significance in all the wrong places. And so today I want to receive the gift of forgiveness that Jesus made available at the cross for me. And I want to follow Jesus and find my significance in who he says I am, what he says I am, and where he wants me to go from this day forward. I want to receive the gift that he gave when he came back from the dead, the gift of the hope of heaven, eternal life with you. And God, I want to receive the reality that I'm a part of your family. Thank you for loving me. Help me follow you from this day forward. Now, God, for the rest of us, help us to find our significance in you first. And as we do that, as that becomes clear, God, will you use that to help us give the powerful gift of I'm proud of you to the people around us. Make these gifts this holiday season and use them to help establish the significance of the people that you put in our life. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name.